Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. We are in a rooted series, and last week I preached the 1A sermon to the 1B sermon, and last week I talked about why we should be rooted and being spiritually rooted like a tree versus being a tumbleweed and just rolling along. And a tumbleweed is a good example of being unrooted and It also is prickly, and it is a negative force, and it is hard, it's harmful, and it spreads bad seed, weed seed. And I've known some spiritual tumbleweeds, and you've probably known some spiritual tumbleweeds. Aren't positive, always negative. Now, if you're rooted, and you're planted in the word of God and in the community of faith, then you're going to grow, you're going to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. And so that's kind of 1A. So if you're starting, if you haven't picked up your book yet, pick your book up. If you'd like to get a book, let us know at the Welcome Center and uh, get get involved. Some of you missed that opportunity and now would like a book. We ordered 10 extra and we are, we're out of the extra. So we'll try to get some more in this next week or so, but you'll be a little behind. So tomorrow you should start in week two, day one, if you're tracking with us through that series. And we have a few life groups and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So the question today, as we're actually starting in the first of 10 weeks of Rooted is, what rhythm do you hear, feel, and move to? Now, I live in town, unlike most of you, but the, the dominant force of our community live outside of the city of Brazil, somewhere in the Wabash Valley. And, and you're welcome to be here if you live outside the outskirts of Brazil. I'm one of the few. And so I have some interesting neighbors, and I have some interesting people go by my house as I sit on my front porch. I, I saw this old man. Go by. He zipped by on a bike. It was a motorized bike. I was thinking, dude, you need a helmet. I didn't know if he was going to stop at the stop sign because I I thought he, the momentum was going so fast that he would go over his handlebars into the, the intersection. That's how fast he was going. A little scary. Then I watched some other people. Some of them are not just kind of, they're just not normal. And they they beat to a different drummer and maybe a different drug as they go by. I'm not making this up. And so they might have their earbuds in or not, and and they're they're in their own rhythm. Now there's an importance to rhythm in everyday life. There's an importance. And so I just kind of, we we did a little rhythmic thing this morning and it kind of added to sol- solidarity in our community of faith here. And if you're online, you may experience this or not. And and the way I started, we're going to practice a rhythm today. I'm going to start out with two, uh, using both feet, but then I'm going to go to one foot. Okay. So, so do this with me. I'm going to go stomp, stomp, clap, stomp, stomp, clap. Stomp, stomp, clap. Now I'm going to go one. Stomp, stomp, clap. Stomp, stomp, clap. Stomp, stomp, clap. Maybe our slide guy will have some music to go along with this. You ready? I can't. I can't do it fast enough with two feet. And the idea is that we will, or God will, God will bless you, unlike the song. Now, most of you admit that rhythm is essential to music, to dance, to poetry, and to speech. So, so important that it's true across all cultures that humans synchronize to and move with musical rhythm. Even my kind of scary neighbors have a rhythm. And, and if you will, 
Life is full of rhythms. There's a circadian rhythm of night and day that we experience every 24 hours. In fact, I do not like the time zone we are on now. I prefer Indiana time because we change. And my body doesn't change. I wake up when the sun rises. I go to sleep when it goes down. And so five o'clock sundown in the winter for me, I want to go to bed at six. But I want to get up with the sun. In the summer, I want the sun to get up early at like six, five forty-five or six a.m. I want it to go around or at seven or eight, not at ten o'clock at night. It messes up my rhythm. In fact, when we changed heart attacks, strokes, and other health problems increased. Anxiety and depression increased when we changed. Did you know that? They did study on they do studies on everything. Human rhythms are intentionally communicative. As you walked into our building today, you had a certain rhythm going on. Some of you are laid back. Some of you are in a hurry. Some of you are on a mission. You are bebopping along in your rhythm. Now, there's an urge, a universal urge to, to move to music. Maybe some of you move in our worship service, in our music. And that is great. We want to encourage that. Now, maybe you grew up in a church where that wasn't common. That's okay. Now, music that is rated as high in groove motivates more spontaneous movements than music that is low in groove. You probably didn't even know that groove was a real word. You might, some of you remember the 60s and the 70s where they would say, well, that's groovy, man. You see, groove is actually the quality of music that makes individual listeners want to move. Some of our worship set was groovy, wasn't it? Where you want to raise your hands, where you want to lower your hands, where you want to participate. And we as humans have a unique capacity to coordinate or synchronize to music. This synchronization is is called either entrainment or attunement. Entrainment or attunement. They may be new words to you, but that is something that we experience in unison. And worship was designed to have a musical element to it that would create community in a large group. Because sharing rhythmic behaviors can can increase social bonding. That because we sing together, that we rhythm together, we are more bonded in common purpose. What's fascinating is that there was a rhythm to the early first century church. And I love that rhythm because it's gone throughout the ages. The church of God has always existed, even though it was persecuted and nearly killed. And yet the rhythm continued. And what was the purpose of that rhythm? It was to deepen your connection with God, his church, and your purpose in the epic story he is writing throughout human history. You see, you're part of that story and part of that rhythm. Now, in Rooted, we're going to be looking at seven rhythms that I would encourage you to commit to practicing, to be the community, to be like the early church where we see growth and transformation in both personal lives and in communities. It's it's amazing. I love the early church. In fact, our church, the Christian churches, came out of a revival movement that wanted just to go back to the Bible, to that first century church, not because they did it, but because of the reason why they did it, because their lives had been transformed in Christ, and they were a new community. They had been transformed, and they were carrying the rhythm of God in that community. And, And you see, 
We are created or called to live beyond the ordinary, in the supernatural, in the extraordinary. And that's different for every one of us. I'm not talking about wild and crazy. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit of God living in you, being transformed by by that work of God in you, bearing forth the fruit of the Spirit and using the gifts that God has given you in the here and now in the time and the age that you were created to be in. There is a purpose and a meaning to every one of your lives. And and the problem is that in our time and culture, we as Christians are very informed. We know the truth of God, but we're not transformed by the truth of God. And that's what the rhythms do. And so I would encourage you, if you have your Bible, if you're online, it'll probably be on your screen. If you have a tablet, to join me in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And I think this is so important to see what the early church was like. So if you'll read along with me, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people, all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Isn't that amazing? That the rhythm of God came through the apostles, through the death of Jesus Christ, transformed their lives, and that rhythm continued in the early believers and all throughout history, even unto the day. Now, the seven rhythms of the early church that rooted them in Christ, we're going to be looking over for the next few weeks. And the first one was daily devotion, that they met together. It was part of their cycle of meeting, but they devoted themselves to the Lord. I don't know if you practice the daily devotion, if you memorize scripture, if you spend time in prayer, but that's important. That was going on. That rhythm was like breathing to them. They didn't do it because they had to. They didn't do it because they were forced to. They did it because they desired to be together. And that's why, you know, if you're joining us online today, you can't be the church online. You need to be the church in person. And if there's any way, any way possible that you could join a fellowship, human to human contact, You need to be able to do that. Now, if you're shut in, if you're infirmed, if you're struggling and you struggle with mobility, that's a different story. Then the church needs to come to you. But you need to gather and be a part of a gathering. The other part is prayer. It's fascinating. Prayer is spending time with God and hearing from God as well as praying to him. As I was traveling to Israel this year on, on both flights, we were, we were on a flight from Chicago to Israel and then Israel to Chicago. It's an overnight flight, about 12, 14 hours. I forget how long it was. It's a long flight. And it was fascinating because there was the most Hasidic Jews I'd ever been around in my life. These were the Orthodox, the very conservative They were wearing the telephone, which you might see the phylactery on their arm. And then on their bicep, there would be this little square cubicle box, which contained four scriptures. And they would have that on their forehead. At certain times during the flight, they'd make their way to the emergency room. I was sitting by a rabbi who knelt down and he prayed. It's fascinating to watch. A little girl sat by my side. I don't know how young she was, but I knew she was younger than me. I was just guesstimating. But she was doing one of these, rocking. And she was practicing Davin, which was the prayers. And the reason why they rock like that was it's like a flame flickering. And the more they rock, the more passionate their prayers would be. I saw that at the wailing wall, men and women divided. Different places, different spaces, both praying. Prayer is like breathing to a Christian. Is prayer that part of your life? Then we look at repentance. 
Repentance is something that we need to do daily. We need to ask forgiveness in our relationships personally. We do corporately during our communion service, the Lord's Supper every Sunday. We, 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 we place our sins before a holy Father who, who sent his Son to die for our sins, that we can re- receive forgiveness and remission. His blood covers our sin. That's something that we have to do. We have to make amends. Every one of us sin. Some of you don't think you do. That's a sin in itself. You're lying before your, to yourself, you're lying to others, and you're lying before God. We all sin and fall short. That's why Jesus had to die for us. If there was any other way, it would have happened, but it did not. Repentance is a part of that rhythm of life. Now, sacrificial generosity. This is, they had all things in common. Now, that that's so fascinating. I, I don't think they had the banking system with the securities that we had today. I don't know what their credit line or their ability to borrow. They were in a very here and now situation where it would have been a lot more scary to give because they were in a hand-to-mouth circumstance but they chose to sacrificially give. Not because they had to, not because they were forced to, but they were compelled internally because they had been transformed and they decided to live by faith and not trust their possessions in their possessions. And when you read that scripture in Acts chapter 2, they served the community out of an overflow of of serving within the body of Christ in the internal community. We've had guests that have come here who've joined our church that said they've never seen a church so externally focused and so community-oriented as ours. And I, I really was kind of astounded at that, the outward focus. We just, we just do that naturally around here. We, we help people all the time. It's, it's a part of our DNA. It's genetically built into the kingdom of God, the family of God just does that. Now, do we don't, we don't answer every call because some calls, I had a call yesterday that wanted, uh, wanted, uh, uh, us to pay for a, uh, somebody's trip to Florida. I said, we don't do that. If they need a, need to go to Florida, they need to figure out a way to do that. That's not on us. But if they need food or clothing, if they need help in some way, and it's a real need. But we have to distinguish and discern those needs. That early community did that. Well, it's fascinating that this would never happen in our church, but there was a little squabble among the widows in the church. There was a little squabble between the Hebrew widows and the Grecian widows, and somebody was getting neglected. And the apostles had some sense to them. They said, you know, our job is to minister the word of God, what we learned from Jesus, to these people. It's not that that they were too important, not that, that, that they couldn't do that or wouldn't do that, but they needed some help because they were devoted to what they were doing, and only they could do it. They had to pass on to the next generation the teachings of Jesus. And so they raised up a group called the deacons. And the deacons served the widows and took care of that squabble and stopped that problem. And they served. Not that they were lesser, not that others, the apostles, were more important. They just had different ministries, different gifts. We read about that in the book of Acts. The other part of what occurred in that early church, in that early community, is they shared the story of what Jesus had done for them, how it changed their lives. It came naturally. It it came from person to person, neighbor to neighbor, friend to friend, work colleague to work colleague, and it just naturally poured out of them like breathing because they were sharing what he had done and how they changed their lives. And it was noticeable because they were noticeably different. The rhythm of their life was different. It was otherworldly. 
as it should be for us. If you're like everyone else, then you're out of rhythm with God, and maybe you have spiritual arrhythmia. Some of you have physical arrhythmia, and you're on a medication. If you have spiritual arrhythmia, you need to focus on God. I read an article this week. It's fascinating. It was about meditating. And, and I'm not talking about transcendental meditation. It was talking about prayer and focusing on God and how breathing in and breathing out and then focusing and meditating on God's word and, and praying, how it, it changes the rhythm of your life. It helps you to pay more attention. It helps you to listen. It, it, it helps you to be more present in the moment in your wellness and, and well-being. I, I think that what I was, as I was reading, I was thinking about the shalom of God, about the peace of God, the health and the blessing of God that, that, that belongs in our lives. It drives out that anxiety and that depression and that unwellness or the sickness. And then worship. Worship. We, we are on a seven-day cycle where we gather And they were worshiping daily as well. And that should be a part of our lives, showing God's worth every day, every moment. But also that seven-day component, that cyclical component of the week. I found this fascinating as I was doing research. Do Do you know that different cultures and different governments try to change the week to make it like 10 days or eight days? Have you heard that? Especially Russia tried to do that 10 day to a, a 10 day week. You know why? Because they deny God. But you know what always happened? It came back to that seven day rhythm. Isn't that fascinating that God knew when He created us that we needed that seven day rhythm of work and rest and worship in our lives? See, we are together in a life journey with Jesus in community and and to live beyond the ordinary is to live in such a way that turns ordinary disciples into world changers i'm of the belief and this is not in scripture but i believe that the power of god in you the spirit of god in you makes a difference in everywhere you go. And I believe that one person can make a difference in in a family, in a workplace, in an organization. I've seen it happen over and over again, that just a little spark, a little courage, a little difference, because of someone living in rhythm with the rhythm of God, can change their world. And it causes the complacent become a consumer of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And and it causes that consumer to become connected into the family of God and to be part of the kingdom of God. And from connection, they become committed to something greater than themselves, greater than this world. And from that commitment, they become compelled. It can't be coerced. Some people have have said, you're not like my other pastor who wants to control my life. I don't want to control your life. Don't come to me to tell tell you what to do. God will do that for you. I will help guide you in a direction where you're made by God through the Spirit of God, you use your giftedness and abilities for God and His kingdom. But I don't want to control you. That's not my job. I'm not trying to compel you. That should come internally from the Spirit of God. If you're in rhythm with God. There's, a, there's an old Jewish story about a child named Mordecai. He was about eight, nine years old, little boy. He was about the age that he needed to learn the Torah and the mitzvah and the commands of God and to be immersed in Jewish culture, and it just wasn't working. The kid was all over the place, sort of like me at eight or nine years old, ADHD to the max. 
The kid was bouncing off the walls. He couldn't settle. He, he didn't have peace. He was anxious, and he drove his parents crazy. So these were uh, rather affluent Jewish, Jewish families. So they, what do they do? They sent him to a counselor. A counselor didn't work. Sent him to a psychologist. That didn't work. They medicated him. It didn't work. So they, they were on the brink of giving up with this little boy. Hopeless. So they took him to a wizened old rabbi. He was a kind old man. You know what the rabbi did? He took him to his breast and he held him almost to the point that the child couldn't breathe. And there was silence. He held him so close that the child couldn't talk. And the child felt the rabbi's heartbeat that beat after the rhythm of God. And in that moment, that child was changed. He was transformed. He went back to school. He could focus. He could learn the Torah and the mitzvah and later be bar mitzvah. And later he came to Christ and knew Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of his life. There was a rhythm of God that made all the difference. Let me ask you again, what rhythm do you hear and feel and move to? I would challenge you to get rooted into the rhythm of God. Let's pray together. Father God, we are grateful for this time, and we're grateful for the work that you do in our lives. And Father, we just pray that we could synchronize, that we could be entrained to be attuned to the work of your Spirit, to the rhythm that you desire for us as individuals and as a community, that we could could grow together and do your will and to serve you, your community, and your kingdom and this world in such a way that they would know that there's an other world that matters most of all. And Father, we are just so grateful for your spirit, for your timing and your presence in our lives. Father, may others be attracted to you through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please stand?